Thank you, Chuck. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here. I haven't been here in a long time, unfortunately, but uh, I'm, thank you very much to the pastor for inviting me to the prior, Father Jonathan, and the community for welcoming me very warmly. Now I'm going to be, you have an, a handout, I will be pretty much following it. Uh, if I'm not, you'll know. <laughs> and then there are some, this is a vast, uh, really there are several large topics tonight, but um, there are s uh, some of the books that I have found helpful, I put on the back. Um, we find ourselves today in what, in a very, very famous book now, Charles Taylor called A Secular Age, in a process that stretches over several centuries, a generally supportive cultural and social environment for the faith has come to be eroded in the West. The secular age takes different forms from one country to another. In the United States here, although the church faces strong secularizing trends in the wider culture, there is a persistent, I suppose you'd say, residual religiosity here, often without now, without particular religious affiliations. On the other side of the Atlantic, the situation is more grave, with the decline of faith more pronounced and more troubling. No one disputes the basic elements of this new, I say new, but it's not so new now, social and cultural situation. But there is considerable disagreement among historians and sociologists I suppose to a certain extent also philosophers and theologians, but the specialists, what about what to call this process? Is it a religious decline, strictly speaking, or simply a long-term process of religious change, which some people favor? Callum Brown, this is the, in England, in an ominously entitled The Death of Christian Britain, attribute secularization, interestingly, to a gradual loss of interest in religion on the part of women. Hugh McLeod, excellent books, offers a balanced account, while a sobering volume by the former Anglican canon, he's now a Catholic, Edward Norman, traces the seepage of secularizing trends into the church itself. And of course, our Dominican wonderful Dominican confrere Aidan Nichols keeps us all hoping for the best. If you, there's a wonderful book of his uh, you can see. Now it's important for us to try to understand, no doubt about it, the history of this process and the situation in which we find ourselves now, but that is not the principal focus of this presentation tonight, although if you have questions you could ask them. My sense is that it would be more helpful to you to address some of the challenges that face us in these circumstances. In the, as I say, the proclamation of the faith, but that would mean preaching, it means teaching, it could mean catechesis, or it mean, can be talking with your friends. I want to say what are some of these challenges? There are some that I have left out that could be considered very important, but I'm going to just do three as you'll see. What can those of us who are charged with preaching, catechesis, and the communication of the faith do to address these challenges? Why does it matter that we do so effectively? These are some of the questions I will be considering. Now, when the challenges are at least in part intellectual, and this is a Dominican up here, okay, <laughs> when the issues of the correct meaning of the Catholic faith are involved, when the misunderstandings of what it is that the Catholic Church proposes, really that God proposes in Revelation, that can block the way to the encounter with the living God, or to participation in liturgical worship, or to the life of faithful discipleship, 
in these situations some form of apologetics, what we have called it traditionally, is called for. Now, of course, not all of the challenges are intellectual in nature, but this evening we are going to be considering those sorts of challenges that can be reasoned through. Okay? In particular, I want to consider some specific intellectual challenges that arise from within the wider culture and have been internalized, unfortunately, by many people in their own personal understanding of the faith. They continue to be Catholics, but have already begun, in a sense, to depart from the faith in an intellectual way. It's a critical task for us, and um, as I say, I will only be scratching the surface. As Catholic believers, we have to respect and be willing to engage the intellectual challenges and questions that people pose in their struggle to understand the Catholic faith. We have to avoid the temptation, huge, to fudge, to adapt the Catholic faith so as to make it palatable to modern tastes and expectations. This so-called accommodationist approach, that was an, uh, an adjective coined by Peter Berger, gosh, in the 60s, accommodationist approach, accommodating the faith to the, uh, the uh, challenges. Generally, we have seen over these 50 years since Peter Berger gave that speech to the American Academy of Religion, fails. It doesn't work. Whatever else may be wrong with it. There is a risk in this approach that the Christian message becomes indistinguishable from everything else on offer in the market stalls of secularized religious faith. To quote Edward Norman, quoted by Nichols, in the powerful yet soft secularizing totalitarianism of distinctively modern culture, our greatest enemy is the church's own internal secularization, which when it occurs does so largely through, quoting again Norman, the largely unconscious adoption of the ideas and practices of seemingly benign adversaries. That is a marvelous expression of the situation. Addressing the challenges to faith, whatever the audience we have in view, demands a kind of robust form of apologetics. Um, not aggressive, but robust, vigorous. No one in his right or her right mind will be interested in a faith about which its exponents seem too embarrassed to communicate forthrightly. We have to be convinced that the fullness of the truth and beauty of the message about Jesus Christ is powerfully attractive in its own right when it is communicated without apologies. That's different from apologetics, or compromise. Our reasoning has to be based on solid theological principles and operate within a vision of the Catholic faith in its integrity and interconnectedness. I'm going to focus on three challenges tonight, or misunderstandings, depending on the point of view you have, that must be addressed, must be, these three must be addressed, they are critical ones, to help people encounter the living God in faith. I think they're the, the biggest challenges to overcome in preaching, catechesis, and evangelization. They are powerful and well entrenched and strongly reinforced by the wider culture in many, many subtle ways. It will not be easy to dispel them. They concern what it means to call Christ the Savior, what it means to be authentically human, and what it means to be moral. I want to offer you some understanding of the nature of these challenges and some ideas on how to confront them. The first, why we need the Savior who is not just any Savior. Now, remarkably, the most profound challenge we face concerns Jesus Christ himself. You would have thought maybe not so but it's the case. 
the most fundamental and prevailing misunderstanding of the Catholic faith that we face is the notion that it is arrogant to claim that Jesus Christ is the unique mediator of salvation. Your reaction will probably be, well, we stop claiming that, we may as well close up shop. But th that is the case. To ascribe a uniquely salvific role, some think, to Jesus Christ, seems to constitute a denial of the salvific role of other religious founders, and thus could be an affront to their communities. You've all heard this. The origins of this difficulty lie deep in the mentality of post-enlightened modernity, post-enlightenment modernity and its theological progeny. On both sides of the Reformation divides, by the way. According to this mentality, all religions express some experience of the absolute or ultimate or transcendent. A friend of mine once said, a Yale friend, said, capital letters do a lot of work here. These words, absolute, ultimate, and transcendent, you have to see as being capitalized. However it is named or described, that encompasses worldly existence. No religion, they say, many say, can claim to possess a priv privileged description okay, of a reality incomprehensible and ineffable to all equally. nor to afford unique access to a realm, in principle, available to all equally. We might call this mentality and the religious outlook it fosters the culture of pluralism. It surrounds us on every side and is often found in the church itself as the ferocious reaction, if you, some of you may remember, to Dominus Jesus, now 20 years ago almost, amply demonstrated. In order to address this challenge, we need in the first place to make it clear that our faith in Christ's uniqueness, his unique role in salvation, does not entail a devaluation of the world's religions. The religions of the world are monuments to the human search for God. As Pope Benedict frequently said, are, uh, are explicitating something, a very strong theme of John Paul II. The religions of the world, I'll repeat, are monuments to the human search for God. As such, they are worthy of respect and study because of the immense cultural witness uh, to the desire for God implanted in every human heart that they represent. But the Christian faith attests not only to the human search for God, but as Pope St. John Paul II famously said, principally to God's search for us. I remember a, a, a book, not a very good book, but it had one very good thing in it, and that is uh, the image of a mountain and of a person searching for God going up to the top of the mountain thinking that that's where God would be found, only to discover that God had gone down the other side to meet him. What God wants to share with us is nothing less than the communion of life, a share or participation in the divine Trinitarian life. This is the basic starting point for understanding the unique role of Jesus Christ in the salvation of the human race. For the idea, my dear friends, the idea that God wants to share the communion of his life, that is, to provide to non uh, uh, to creaturely persons, non-divine persons, as intimate as possible, a union with him, that idea cannot come from anybody but God himself. Understand? We cannot, we cannot, it's an inconceivable and for many people absurd assertion. The initiative here comes from God's side, both to reconcile us because of sin. We are not holy. He is holy. And to make possible a kind of life that would not only be impossible, but also unthinkable. We are humans, and he is God. We are creatures, and he is the uncreated. What could be in common for, to form the basis of some kind of relationship 
under those circumstances, unless they are provided, unless the necessary conditions are, are do you want to say, supplied on God's side. Salvation in this comprehensive sense is nothing that can be arranged or organized by human beings. You see? Any more than if I want to be your friend, I can do so without your wanting it to, to be the case as well. It cannot come from the created order, for the created order has neither the resources to achieve nor the imagination to conceive such a destiny for human persons. Arians, neo-Arians, for all of you historians, and their fellow travelers throughout history are willing to acknowledge that Jesus is a savior, but then it seems, to quote an Anglican theologian, Alan Torrance, then it seems that salvation is nothing more than a minor adjustment internal to the contingent order. Salvation is something that one creature performs in relation to others. Given that salvation in the Christian sense of the term involves both reconciliation of sinners, making people holy who aren't, and the elevation of creaturely persons to a new kind of life, making people who are create, created nonetheless able to engage in an uncreated communion, cannot come from within this world. Saviors are a dime a dozen when one fails to grasp what's at stake in this claim. We need to be delivered not just from error, nor from just suffering, nor from desire. If any of you know anything about the history of religions, you can identify here. Nor from just injustice, nor from poverty, nor from any other problems, not just from that. To understand what Christian faith means and promises by salvation, we must grasp the peril of the human condition as well as the glory that is the human destiny in the economy of salvation as revealed to us through Jesus Christ. God desires nothing less than to share his life with us. If the salvation that the triune God wills for the entire human race entails communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then creaturely and sinful obstacles to this communion must be overcome. It has never been claimed. It has never been claimed of anyone but Jesus Christ that he could and did overcome these obstacles. This is very important to remember when you're having discussions with people. It has never been claimed by, of anyone but Jesus Christ that he could and did overcome these obstacles and that he could and did make us sharers in the divine life. Through him we are both healed of sin and raised to an adoptive participation to use a, uh, an expression favored by the fathers in the life of the Blessed Trinity and nothing less. The obstacles to this participation are either overcome or they are not. If they are not overcome, then Christians have nothing for which to hope, for themselves or for others. You see, in that case, they will hawk an empty universal salvation on the highways of the world. If Christians abandon the proclamation of Christ's unique mediatorship, this is John Paul, terribly important. If Christians abandon the proclamation of Christ's unique mediatorship as the divine only begotten Son of the Father, they will have no other mediatorship with which to replace it. You see the force of this point? To me, it's very, very powerful. We need the Savior who is not just any Savior, not only for ourselves, but for all these other people, too, that we're worried about. Not offending, but telling them the truth. How persons who are not now explicit believers in Christ can come to share in the salvation that God desires for the whole human race and that Christ alone makes possible 
is a serious, large topic and has been much thought about. But the solution to this problem is not denying the, uni the unique mediatorship of Christ. That's a solution to nothing. For Christians to have a truly universal hope and confidence in the salvation of persons who are not Christians, they have to affirm the unique role of Christ in bringing salvation about, not just for Christians, but for everyone else as well. Okay, the second one. Why we need Christ to become authentically human. The second challenge concerns what it means to be human. Here, the fundamental misunderstanding is shaped by what has been called the culture of authenticity by, do I mention, by, also by Charles Taylor, a very, very interesting guide to these issues. This was in a book called The Ethics of Authenticity, although he also discusses it in a secular age. This is the idea, authenticity, that somehow being a Christian involves giving up or suppressing what is uniquely human in each of us and accepting an external criterion or measure which is alien to one's true self. Like the aforementioned culture of pluralism, the supporting matrix of ideas behind this sense that, to quote Taylor's ethics of authenticity, each of us has an original way of being human. This is an ingrained feature of modernity and penetrates popular culture at every level now, I mean, in spades. Sometimes it's called expressive individualism, for you that like those wonderful labels, and it resembles moral relativism. But it actually functions as a kind of moral ideal. It's not amorality, it's a substitution for morality of a classical kind. Here I'm going to quote Taylor again, only this is the secular age. The soft relativism that seems to accompany the ethic of authenticity asserts, let each person do their own thing. One shouldn't criticize the values of others because they have a right to live their own life. Excuse me, they have as much a right to live their own life as you do. The sin, he says, that is not tolerated is intolerance. Now, according to this is important, according to Taylor, it is immoral to be intolerant of the values of others. And moreover, and more importantly for our purposes, if it is immoral, immoral to allow some extrinsic measure to displace what one thinks of as his or her authentic self. This, in other words, so it's not relativistic really, it's a moral absolute. Fundamental to this moral ideal is the understanding that, again to quote Taylor, a secular age, that each of us has his or her way of realizing our humanity, and that it is important to find and live out one's own as against surrendering to conformity with a model imposed on us from outside by society, by the previous generation, or by religious or political authority. Taylor really understands this, I think. These ideas pose, you can see immediately, tremendous challenge to a true understanding of any religious. I mean, I mean this, this is a challenge for Buddhism, Islam. But we're not talking about them right now. It's a true understanding of what Christian disciples really entails for every human being is here radically challenged. In response, the first thing that needs to be affirmed follows directly from Christ's unique mediatorship. To become sharers in the communion of divine life, we must become like the Son. So that, as we say in one of the can Eucharistic prep prayers of Sunday, seventh Sunday of the year, 
I mean, not the seventh Sunday of the year, number seven of the prefaces, so that the Father sees and loves in us what he sees and loves in Christ. That's our ticket. We become conformed to Christ. The very word conformed is for us a sacred word in theological anthropology. We become conformed or configured to Christ in order to be at home in the shared life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, and this is the key, but conformation to Christ, that is the principle of our transformation, it's a conformation that is a transformation, is not a slavish conformity to a model, but the realization of our distinct and unique personal identity. This is massively important, really. This must be so, for otherwise the communion with the Blessed Trinity to which this transformation is ordered could not be achieved. The image of God consists precisely in the spiritual capacities of knowing and loving, right? That make interpersonal communion possible. To claim, as does expressive individualism, that each person has an original way of being human is not to deny that each person shares a human nature which can be described as ensouled bodiliness and is characterized by specific natural capacities including capacities to know and love other persons. In the Christian understanding, authentic interpersonal communion presupposes the full realization, not the absorption or suppression of individual persons. See? God is not interested in us disappearing. This is not Brahmanic Hinduism or, or Buddhism in which the end is impersonal. See? Thus, if Christ is to be the pattern for the transformation accomplished in us by the Holy Spirit, it can only mean that in being conformed to him, we each discover and realize our unique identity as persons. You see, so we do not want to, we're not going to fight with the ethics of authenticity. We embrace it. This is an immense and astonishing claim, however. Quoting the Gospel, if a man wants to be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his life? Or what will he give in return for it? That's from Matthew 16, but it's in the other synoptics in some way or other. Here Christ asserts, in effect, that each person will find his or her true self only by being conformed to him. Now, in ordinary experience, this would be an outrageous thing to say. None of us, whether as teachers or parents or pastors, no matter how inflated our conceptions of ourselves or how confident our sense of our abilities, would ever dare to say to anyone in our charge that they will find their true selves only by imitating us. We might think it, but we wouldn't say it. <laughs> right? That's why you're laughing. Yes, but this is precisely what Christ asserts. In effect, this means that an indefinite number of persons will realize their distinctive identities by being conformed to him. Only the Son of God could say such a thing. Only the Son of God could make such a claim on us. Only the perfect image of God, who is the person of the Son, could constitute the principle and pattern for the transformation and fulfillment of every human person who has ever lived. The more we are conformed to his infinite image, the more authentically do we become our true selves. This is what Christian anthropology teaches. If you have heard anything else, don't believe it. You may have. And you will certainly, this is certainly true about what I'm going to say in the third section here, why the moral law is good for us. In a way, at the practical level, this may be the most terrific challenge, um, whereas at the theological level, 
the Christological challenge with which I started is the most profound. Here, the challenge is the idea that the moral law is a more or less arbitrary constraint in which certain things are permitted right, and certain things are forbidden. Irrespective of the bearing of these injunctions on human goodness and flourishing. Now, be patient with me, I'm going to unpack that. This idea has a very long history, stretching back to the nominalist moral theology. For any of you who have studied this, you will recognize what I'm talking about. That took hold in the 14th century and has remained influential ever since. If you want to read more about this, the Dominican. Surveys Pinkers, whom I mentioned, in the, has written a lot about it. It served to foster what came to be regarded and experienced, I think probably by a lot of us, at least certainly the gray hairs and maybe others too, as a kind of culture of legalism in Catholic moral theology that was decisively rejected by the magisterium in the encyclical Veritatis Splendor, which may be in the end, one of the most important, if not the most important, of the in writings of the Magisterium of John Paul II. It's still fighting to be accepted among theologians, I should say. But as the Italians say, la chiamo perdere. Let's leave that aside. A legalistic perspective on the moral life creates a significant barrier for many people to authentic Christian existence. Following the lead of Veritatis Splendor, it is of critical importance in addressing this challenge to insist on the priority of the categories of good and evil for assessing the rightness and wrongness of particular actions, not vice versa. Whereas legalistic moral systems insist, or at least imply, that, now pay attention, this is important, that actions are good, parentheses, and thus right, because permitted, okay, and bad, parentheses, and thus wrong, because forbidden, authentic Catholic moral teaching maintains that a certain course of action is forbidden and wrong because it's bad for you, for the agent, as the philosophers say the moral agent, while another course of action is permitted and right because it is good for the agent. You might say, well, the commandments do not simply lay down requirements that are indifferent vis-a-vis -vis their impact on human goodness and happiness. Believe it or not, many people have come to think that they are indifferent but that what's at issue is obeying them. The only good, the only virtue is obedience in some moral systems. In legalistic moral doctrine, the principle here I have, the, I'm anticipating the next sentence, is obedience. The principal virtue is obedience. One obeys the commandments, whatever their content, because they are enjoined by God. In classic moral theology, the observance of the commandments is meant to foster the specific virtues, not just obedience, with which they are concerned, and thus the overall good of the moral agent. In other words, the commandments of the moral law treat primarily of good and evil rather than of the permitted and the forbidden. If you, you might say that right and wrong track over good and evil, not vice versa. If I, you, you've had, you know, you're, you're cooking dinner and one of your kids comes in eating a fistful of Oreos and you say, stop eating those Oreos. And they say, why, Ma? You have, okay, you have many possible responses. <laughs> this is a lesson in the logic of moral discourse. So therefore, it's a little artificial. You have one course of action would be to say, because in this house we do not eat Oreos before eating dinner. You're appealing to a rule and to your authority. You could say, if you want to eat Oreos before dinner, go next door. 
they don't have this rule. Okay? The other possible response would be to say, well, I'm making your favorite dinner. If you eat those Oreos, you won't be able to eat what you really like. You see, there, you're appealing to use moral, the language of moral discourse, to the good of the agent, not to your authority. Now, of course, your authority should s support your, um, the, the, um, the, the uh, injunctions, to use a formal word, that you impose. I mean, so you're not an arbitrary, you're not just imposing arbitrary rules. The rules in your house are rules for the good of your children and everybody else in the household. But you see the difference. That's a tremendous difference. Now, sometimes, uh, you know, you have to just appeal to your authority because the people under your charge don't have enough knowledge or experience to understand that what you're saying is good for them. Sometimes they just have to do what you tell them. I mean, in the novitiate, I'm sure that that was the case. Anybody who's been in charge of formation will know what I'm talking about here. Sometimes people just don't know why what you're telling them is good for you, for, for them. However, again, apart from those um, qualifications, the point, the distinction is hugely important. Okay? Whether the rule is for the good of the agent or simply uh, the uh, uh, arbitrary uh, imposition of an injunction. Many, 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 many people think that that's what the commandments are, unfortunately. The commandments, however, express an order established by divine wisdom, not principally by will. You see, the problem here, philosophically, for any of you who are interested in these issues, is voluntarism, insisting that God's power uh, so, trumps his wisdom, and that while we could get an insight into his wisdom, his power is opaque. The exercise of his power is not intelligible, or it's uh, less intelligible. Aquinas insisted on this. It might be one of the most important things. It was no, no accident that it was his, the secunda pars, the whole moral teaching of the Summa, which was often in manuscript tradition reproduced. Um, more than the other parts, the first and the third part. The cr created finalities of human nature are served by a good and virtuous life. To use an analogy of which St. Paul might approve, and I think that you will find this extremely cogent, the commandments are more like an, a, an athlete's daily exercise and diet regime, regimen, then they are like the traffic laws. Traffic regulations require that we stop on red and go on green, and faster on yellow, but that's certainly true in Italy. I don't know about here. However, but it could be just as well the other way around. It could be stop on green and go on red. The athlete, however, follows the daily regime enjoined by his or her coach in order to achieve and maintain a certain level of performance otherwise unattainable, right? I don't, you don't, if, if you want to run the marathon and you get a coach, if you've got the money to get a coach, I mean, and you, you say, he gives you the regime, he, you're not doing what he tells you because you're obeying him. You're doing what he tells you because you want to be able to run the marathon more than just run around the block. There is a fit, nice word, a fit between the regime and the results, all things being equal, that you don't get sick or break your leg. The moral law is like that. It contains non-arbitrary injunctions that guide us steadily toward the good in every action and thus toward our ultimate good. At this point, we might turn to St. Augustine, particularly to his confessions, to understand what is involved in this authentically Catholic understanding of the moral law. St. Augustine frequently invites his readers to consider the things that they have desired and the things that they desire now. To consider, in effect, the experience of desire 
When we have thought about the things that we have desired and sought, St. Augustine asks us to acknowledge that in the end we have often lost interest and become bored with these very things, having acquired them, and that we move on to seeking other things. Our closets and drawers are full of these things, in case you're wondering where they are. For St. Augustine, this observation, to my mind, is not so much a cause for lament as it is an occasion for insight. For in pondering the experience of desire, we learn something important, very important, about ourselves. No good thing that we have wanted, and possessed even, can finally quench desire itself because we are made for an uncreated good, which is God, in whom all desire finally rests. You see? I think this is an important way of interpreting what St. Augustine, it's, it is, you could say, depressing to observe all the things in our closets and drawers, but I don't think St. Augustine is interested particularly in making us depressed. I think he wants us to be, to learn something. This means, of course, that the good things of this world, and all the more so the good of other persons, far from being obstacles in our quest for ultimate happiness, point us, as sometimes St. Augustine is interpreted as saying, point us to the good itself, which is their source and in which they share. As Aquinas would say, I think, if we do not love the good things of this world, how shall we be able to love their maker? The triune God who made us for himself and who wants to share the communion of Trinitarian love with us uses the good things of this world to lead us to him who is, we could say and do say, goodness, capital G here, surely, itself. Now the danger and tragedy, sometimes, of human existence, as we all can attest, is to desire and love the created good as if it were divine. There is always this possibility that we will hang our hearts on things that cannot bear the weight. We've all done it and we will all keep doing it. That is what sin is from the, from the authentic, the correct, Catholic perspective, not disobeying a rule. God help us, how everybody, how so many people fell for that is beyond my soul. But through the guidance of the moral law and the assistance of divine grace, rightly ordered desire. One, um, somebody has written a wonderful article called, on Augustine's Moral Theology, The Education of Desire. Law as the Education of Desire. Rightly ordered desire and love of the good things of this world and the good of other persons is already a participation in the good which is God himself. Eros, as Benedict wrote in oh, God, his encyclical on love. Thank you, thank you. Eros is meant to lead us to agape, to the love of God and to the love of one another in God. We must res resist absolutely the misreading, sometimes perverse, that claims to see in Christian faith the suppression of ordinary fulfillments of earthly life, particularly human intimacy and love, in favor of a good beyond life. Okay, the conclusion. Christianity makes more than a uh, excuse me, emotional sense. We need, why we need the Savior who is not just any Savior, why we need Christ to become authentically human, why the moral law is good for us, these are only some, though in many ways the most critical, of the challenges we face in the secular age. In order to address them, we need a confident evangelizing spirit and a robust, though not overbearing, apologetics. In some, such circumstances, not unlike those faced by the apostles, really, and the early Christian communities, many have drawn this parallel of the ancient world. Retrenchment is just not an option, nor is crying it's a mystery. 
That's one thing Dominicans have an allergy to, people who cry mystery when they just don't know the answer. And where, when there is an answer at least partly available, if they have just studied. Sorry. A cousin of mine who was always complaining about the fact that the teachers in her theology classes always would say, it's a mystery, and it was very frustrating to her uh, to be told. And there are mysteries, but we should cry mystery when it's the, the point of mystery has really arrived. Neither can we take refuge in the powerful emotional comforts of the Christian faith. This enticing path is traced out by British author Francis Spufford in a recent book, Unapologetic. Why, despite everything, Christianity can still make surprising emotional sense. It's a very interesting book, actually. His argument is, in a nutshell, that what makes Christianity work for most of us is not so much its doctrinal as its emotional truths. Right? The way, in short, it helps us to get through the terrible muddle of our lives, especially the muddles we create ourselves. I think he means by that sins. Excuse me. <laughs> Give me just a second here. I'm coming at the, to the very end. I can't find what I'm looking for. The emotional sense is, this emotional sense is not something that one can be reasoned into. God knows what Spufford would think of my paper. But something that one can only grasp through experience. And he's surely onto something. But I think that most of us would say that it's not enough. The words of the first letter of Peter, of course, are clear and they come to mind immediately, no doubt. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting of the hope that is in you. Behind the emotional truth of the Christian faith, there needs to be something solid or something more, let's say, if it is to be anything more than a comforting illusion, a tale you tell children when they're afraid of the dark which is what many people think religion is about, by the way. The emotional sense that the Christian faith makes is rooted in convictions, I think, principally that God wants to make a place for us in the life of the Blessed Trinity, and that Jesus Christ opens the way to this communion, and that our transformation in his image not only gets us through the muddles, but also launches us upon the life of glory. There will certainly be occasions when it would be important and necessary for us to explain how all this can be not only emotionally comforting, but also really true. Thank you very much.